wanted to highlight the Obama policy towards the continent uh, in the midst of uh, the President's trip that's coming up on uh, Wednesday, uh, the 26th. And uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, uh, we discussed the policy, not just as it relates to the trip, but looking beyond the trip as well and looking at how the policy has been in the past and also what we see might be uh, the signs for future, what we would hope would happen in the future. Uh, we were, once African peoples have been worried that uh, the U.S. policy to the continent at times has been negative to some of the progresses and gains that the continent has made. And these are some of the views that uh, uh, the organizations uh, which make up ADNA also share with the uh, our fellow uh, brothers and sisters on the African continent. And one of the, some things we wanted to highlight was militarization in the, in the U.S., uh, policy towards the continent, uh, food, agriculture and investment, and land grabs, and also the financial integrity and economic development. So the panelists here who will touch on some of these issues, and I won't, I won't uh, belabor my introduction. I'll introduce each of them first. I'll start with uh, Mr. Dote Akwe, who is uh, from um, Amnesty International. Uh, he's the Managing Director for Government Relations at Amnesty International. And he is from Ghana. I wouldn't say originally from Ghana, I'll say he's from Ghana. <laughs> Great. Yeah, Thank you. I think I have three minutes, right? You have three minutes. No more than three minutes. <laughs> okay. I'm, and then I'm, I'm just going to read it very, very quickly um, a, sh a short kind of contextual statement and then focus on three key points, which is our stopping gender based violence against women, uh, just stopping discrimination and violence against the members of the LGBT community, and the threats to civil society organizations continentally. Um, on June 26th, President Obama will leave on a historic visit to Senegal, South Africa, and Tanzania. Historic because he is the first African-American president of the United States, and historic because his visit comes just after the 50th anniversary of the founding of the OAU. The stated focus of the president's trip, promoting trade and investment, is welcome, but it ignores critical issues that a historic visit should speak to and it oversimplifies a dialogue between the United States and the continent, and a continent with complex issues and legitimate aspirations. It also fails to address a U.S. foreign policy that is unbalanced and is not contributing to the development of the continent and its people or the long-term interests of the United States. The limited focus does not seek to build support for priorities espoused by the Obama administration, such as climate change or women's rights, and protecting the rights and members of the LGBT community, leaving these issues to vague promises of being taken up behind closed doors, if they are referenced at all. The trip also begins with a continued vacancy in the position of Assistant Secretary of State for Africa, when at the same time, developments in the Sahel region have now been categorized as a major front in the so-called war on terror, and the U.S. Department of Defense is deploying drones and mobilizing other U.S. assets in a pattern that is all too familiar and has led to dubious success in other parts of the world as well as in Africa. We believe that the administration has to take this opportunity to speak not only to the countries that he visits, but also to the continent at large and to the African people. Um, as a historic figure, he has an opportunity to speak to a large platform. And we think that the issues of gender-based violence in the LGBT community and threats to civil society are critical ones, but unfortunately not the only ones. Very briefly, members of the LGBT community across the continent face grave abuses. These abuses range from discriminatory laws to violence, stigmatization by the communities in which they live, homophobia, transphobia, um, and also all of this is encouraged by laws rendering LGBT individuals criminals based on their actual or perceived sexual orientation or gender identity. This criminalization leads to countless arrests, appalling intimidation tactics, and hate crimes, including assault and murder. Tonight, Amnesty International is going to be releasing a report on the rights of LGBT community members, and the statistics are quite alarming. I'll be ready to answer questions um, after this. The issue of gender-based violence against women is something that is unfortunately well known, but still has not received adequate prioritization, both by African governments and the international community. Discrimination continues through limited access to education, economic opportunity, resources, resources and adequate health services, 
as well as the risk of violence. And this is both in and out of conflict zones such as the Democratic Republic of the Congo and places such as South Africa and Kenya. Finally, I'll speak to the issue of civil society organizations. Unfortunately, this critical component to enjoying human rights is under increasing threat as governments systematically restrict or shut down the activities of civil society organizations. They seek to criminalize them, to outlaw their existence, or restrict their funding. And for example, in 2009, the Ethiopian government, under the late Melis Zenawi, introduced the Charities and Societies Proclamation, which put into place restrictions on what they could work on, how they could be funded, and where they could operate. This resulted in effect of killing off any civil society human rights organizations in the country and therefore denied the Ethiopian people the right and the ability to exercise their human rights. We sincerely hope that pre the president is going to raise these issues publicly and forcefully as opposed to just behind closed door meetings. And I think I'm probably over my three minutes, so I'll stop there. <laughs> you just made it just in time. <laughs> uh, and then our next uh, speaker is a uh, uh, Kislein. Sherry Stahl, she is um, uh, with Action Aid Senior Policy Analyst at Action Aid USA. Thank you. Um, for those of you who don't know Action Aid USA, Action Aid um, is uh, part of an international federation of organizations. Action Aid um, International is headquartered in Johannesburg, South Africa, and Action Aid has partner offices in Senegal as well as in Tanzania, where the president will be visiting um, in a couple of days. Um, and Action Aid very much welcomes, indeed, the president's visits to these countries, and we believe that. It is a wonderful opportunity for him to meet with civil society organizations, particularly smallholder farmer communities, for him to hear firsthand from them um, what it is that they need um, in the U.S. policies and programs in their countries. Um, Action Aid and its partner organizations have specific concerns. Um, the president is going to these to Africa. Um, a year after um, the the formation of the new alliance, as well as the creation, the um, the, the elaboration, of the the approval of the um, tenure guidelines, the voluntary guidelines for food security, um, these these two were um, they were um, launched in 2012, and the concern is that um, the new alliance is not necessarily helping smallholder farmer communities. Um, specifically, the new alliance is. Um, promoting um, the formation of land banks where large multinational corporations will be able to um, have uh, an inventory of land um, for them to um, um, put forward the investments. However, the lands are being taken from smallholder farmer communities who need that land for food security. We know that 50 to 90 percent of the population in Africa depends on land for food and for livelihoods. So this is a major concern for us. Um, in addition, we are very much concerned about the fact that um, the new alliance is moving forward while the tenure guidelines are not yet being implemented in country. Um, the tenure guidelines are a great opportunity for smallholder farming communities to be able to have a voice in um, the development of their countries. And, um, we, we strongly urge the president to listen to the voices of smallholder farming communities to hear what it is that they want for their own development. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our next uh, presenter is uh, Dave Kerr. He is the um, sorry, uh, chief, chief, chief economist at the uh, Global Financial Integrity. Uh, thank you. Um, Global Financial Integrity uh, was founded about seven years ago uh, to look into the issues of uh, illicit uh, capital outflows from poor developing countries. The issue of illicit capital uh, is basically a human rights issue because poor countries that lose scarce capital are unable to alleviate poverty and meet millennium development goals such as nutrition, food security, uh, education, etc. Now, we did a joint study recently with the African Development Bank uh, and uh, we presented the findings of this report at the annual meetings of the African Development Bank in Marrakesh uh, in May. And uh, one of the main findings is that um, Africa lost between $600 billion to $1.4 trillion over a 30-year span. Um, basically, how did we come at this, uh, at this figure? Well, we looked at both recorded flows, recorded capital inflows into each African country, such as foreign direct investment, uh, loans, et cetera, 
And we also looked at the unrecorded capital outflows from those countries, and we took a net of the two. And we found that for every dollar that African countries get in general uh, through aid, $10 leave the back door through illicit outflows. So uh, a country can never achieve its development goals with those kinds of ratios. That if for $1, you lose $10 in illicit outflows. Now, how are illicit outflows generated? They're basically generated through three different sets of drivers. You have macroeconomic instability, such as high inflation, high deficits. Those could be driving it. You have structural issues, such as um, uh, income inequality, that is the widening gap between the rich and the poor. And you also have uh, governance issues, such as corruption and uh, weak government institutions, lack of uh, voice and accountability, political instability. Now, uh, the United States can uh, have a major impact on African countries, helping the African countries uh, realize some of these objectives by uh, helping them to, uh, the, well, the, the, there are two, there are two uh, aspects to this. One is that the domestic policies are required to stem the internal generation and transmission of capital flight, of illegal capital flight. On the other side is also the question of absorption. Where does this illegal funds end up? And that's where the United States can help African countries by promoting financial transparency and accountability, by making it more difficult for tax havens and banks to take this money with their eyes closed and help uh, you know, uh, the corrupt country, uh, citizens of, uh, in Africa to deposit this money in numbered accounts and so on and so forth. So that would be a huge contribution if President Obama could take the lead in um, international fora, such as the G20, the G8, uh, to push uh, industrial countries to make it more difficult for tax havens and banks to absorb these illicit flows. So I'll leave it that, uh, at this now, at this point, and I'll invite questions from you. Thank you. Thank you. And our next presenter is Amir Woods, who is the co-director of our Foreign Policy in Focus uh, project of our Institute for Policy Studies. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. I'm uh, also here representing, in addition to the Institute for Policy Studies, the Association of Concerned Africa Scholars that IPS is, is proud to be a member of. And I will restrict my three minute remarks to, um, to the statement from the ACAS, Association of Concerned Africa Scholars Demilitarization Task Force, um, that was really um, drafted under the leadership of David Wiley at the um, Michigan State University. While we understand that individual countries need security and peace as a precondition for development, we do not believe that increased militarism, systems of command and control, and authoritative suppression are the necessary preconditions for human security at home or in Africa. Specifically, although most of us are not pacifists, we are against the focus of the US on building larger, more politically powerful, more technologically equipped, and more expensive militaries in African countries, and the enlargement of the US military at home. Enlarging and empowering African militaries reflects a policy based on a belief and a habit that military solutions are the first step towards peace, and that social turbulence and conflict can best be controlled with military enforcement and suppression. We believe that military responses to conflict, protests, and contestation in Africa are counterproductive and result in gross violations of human rights, deaths of civilians, and the development of long-term social grievances that later can erupt into new conflicts. Two, we believe that the introduction of the philosophy and strategy of the global war on terror or overseas contingency operations into Africa with unilateral aggressive militarization has not and will not facilitate peace. Rather, we believe that US military engagement in Africa should be limited to support of multilateral operations of the African Union and the United Nations. Three, we believe that the new US policy of the quote, whole of government, unquote, approach to combine State Department, U.S. Agency for International Development, Central Intelligence Agency, and Department of Defense policy and planning is a mistake 
to the extent that it erases the important differences between the traditional policymaking in the administration and State Department and the implementation of the military aspects of that policy abroad by the Department of Defense. We are especially disturbed at the explosive growth of the Department of Defense in policy assessment and policy making on Africa. In the numbers of US military personnel relative to non-military personnel representing the US in Africa, in the militarization of the programs of the Department of the State and USAID, and in the apparent decline in the role, <coughs> influence, and resources of both the Department of State and the US Agency for International Development. Four, we are deeply troubled at the broad and hidden engagement in dozens of African countries of the US Special Operations Command, AfroTroops, with a mandate, and I quote, to disrupt, degrade, dismantle, and ultimately defeat those who attacked America on 9-11, unquote. Without any opportunity for public policy debate about the targets of their attacks and the nature of their actions or any broader reflection on both the collateral civilian damage, the license to take action without public accountability, and the wisdom and effectiveness of a military suppression of dissidents. Five, we are especially concerned that the strategies of aerial attacks since 2007 in Somalia and potentially now in the rest of the Sahel region by C-130 Hercules gunships, attack helicopters, cruise missiles, and now by drones from bases in Africa and Europe can be a source of mounting collateral deaths of civilians and blowback in facilitating the recruitment of new militants. And lastly, six, we advocate more support and resources for conflict resolution and negotiation in Africa in order to develop long-term peace based on the often difficult agreements among different legitimate stakeholders, including the many variety of organizations across the continent and people's movements. With this emphasis on conflict resolution, additional funds are needed for economic development activities in health education, housing, infrastructure, these as incentives for conflicting groups to come to the table and build cooperation across lines of conflict for the reconstruction of, dis of disrupted societies. Thank you. Thank you, Amir Woods. And then uh, our next panelist is uh, Nia Kweta. He's an independent African scholar and analyst, and he's also former executive director at uh, Africa Action. Um, Thank you all very much for being here. Um, my job is to wrap up the bits of the statements and take a broad look at the president's uh, trip. Um, this is his fifth year in, in, in office. So we think that if you look back, he's actually spent um, 20 hours in sub-Saharan Africa. So actually, this trip is long overdue. And it's a good thing that he's picking to go to countries that are not um, so-called US-friendly tyrants, um, that they were excluded. He's going to countries that have challenges, but they, they, if you list African countries working on democracy, the three that he's going to are one that, ones that will uh, raise, uh, get high marks. We also want to tie it to the issue of, uh, of poverty, because the initiative that um, was mentioned has been tied by the administration to the eradication of poverty. We don't think you can have poverty um, by encouraging dictators to hold on. If you listen carefully to what everyone, my fellow panelists have said, tying through there is democratic government, um, rule of law, and the respect for human rights. Now, the president's trip has been billed as having an economic focus, and clearly, economic growth in Africa and development is important for Africa. But we want to stress that it is best done under a democratic umbrella that includes all fa um, facets of society. So we do not want the issue of democratic issues to be forgotten by the president when he's on the continent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nee. Uh, we'll now open up the floor to uh, questions. And if you please um, uh, speak into the mic, there'll be a mic uh, going around and also make sure you identify yourself, your affiliation, so the floor is open. 
Did nothing? Oh, VOA, I think this. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Paul Ndiho uh, from Voice of America. I uh, wanted maybe to talk a little bit about, uh, maybe Emila uh, alluded to it, uh, uh, he talked about uh, peace and security, but I wanted to look at it in the context of uh, terrorism, especially in uh, East Africa and uh, North, North Africa, maybe less specifically Mali. Uh, how would you respond to critics who say that uh, the Obama administration hasn't done enough? Mirrors. Well, we have some of those critics on this panel <laughs> that say the Obama administration hasn't done enough, so they may want to weigh in directly. Um, I, I think for, um, for some of us, and again, we're a coalition, we represent many different organizations here on this panel, um, and, and for some of us, um, we critique the role of the U.S. in uh, particularly the Trans-Sahel Initiative for the past decade, which has trained and professionalized the Malian army. And we look to issues like Captain Sonogo having been to the U.S. It's estimated seven times in the past eight years as indication that the U.S. has focused overwhelmingly on the security sector at the expense of those other building blocks of healthy societies, education, health care, housing. Um, the Sahel region, um, many say, was the result or of the, the outcome, the overflow, the unintended consequences, however you describe it, of, um, of militarism, militarism in, in Libya and the flow of weapons from Libya across borders into Mali. Um, so, so many are really upholding the UN, um, uh, particularly the arms trade treaty recently pushed forward by the UN, and demanding really first that the Obama administration take the opportunity of the trip to actually sign the arms trade treaty to stem the flow of weapons into Africa and to begin to look at those, um, again, those healthy building blocks of societies to rebuild the social fabric, not only in the Sahel, but really throughout the continent. I think uh, nee, you want to add on this? You know, if you look at the responses of ADNAM members to this issue of the Sahel and Mali, if you don't listen carefully, you might think there is a difference of opinion. Um, but if you listen carefully, you will see that the criticism that has been made that the U.S. is not fully engaged sufficiently in the, uh, Mali especially is a question of when. As Emira mentioned, and as others have mentioned, the in fact, the Mali was called for the about the last eight years before they descended into the civil war. I mean, uh, the 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 uh, Libyan I mean, Libya triggered the new civil war in Mali. The eight years before that, Mali had actually been called the star pupil of U.S. policy in the Sahel. The U.S. was the number one partner. And in fact, we published criticisms of U.S. policy in 2010, saying that the emphasis on militarism was way too much. The criticism now is, if you engage with a country, if you flood them with arms and militarism, and it goes wrong, we don't think it's right to turn your back and say others should fix the problem. Others should help Mali um, climb out of the problem in which it is. Now, the Africans and the UN and the European Union have taken the lead, but only on the security sector. Mali has a lot to do to rebuild its society. So the argument here is that it is in the US interest in all manner of ways, from both uh, specific interest and moral, to help Mali rebuild, since they were their partner when they descended into, into the problem. So the US needs to help Mali um, get reconstruction. This is the argument being made. Are there any other comments on the panel? Sure. Uh, okay. Akwa. And I, I think I, I would just add that um, uh, both Amira and Ni mentioned the unbalanced foreign policy. And I think that's probably the other large um, contributing factor that um, in addition to the timeliness of the U.S. response, the, the period in the, prior to that was characterized by a security-based oriented response, um, as well as um, engagement and uh, funding for democracy programs, for human rights programs, for 
building institutions that promote the rule of law and respect for rights have all suffered uh, at the same time as the budget for um, the security-oriented folk policies has continued to rise. And that, I think, has contributed to this also. So it's not just a question of not done enough, but maybe even doing the wrong thing. Can you guys maybe weigh in on Somalia, too? Somalia? Do you want to start? Well, let me start. Let me start. Yeah. Who wants to start? <laughs> before, uh, before they start, I just want to uh, also alert people that uh, the press, that we also have uh, members of the other, other uh, organizations, Friends of the Congo, uh, Jubilee, Mennonite Central Committee, Oblitz, and the African Faith and Justice Network who are here, who can also uh, take part in answering the questions. You know, <coughs> excuse me, with regard to Somalia, um, the, the argument that will be made is this, that, you know, no countries uh, want to find good ways of bringing people together so that there is no conflict, okay? Some conflict takes the, the form of um, terrorism. How do you fight it? And the argument is actually what you need is democracy because if people uh, think the system is inclusive and fair, then they are not going to resort, at least most people are not going to resort to violence in, um, in um, a democratic system. And so what you need to uh, have is a situation in which every group feel, does not feel it necessary to resort to violence or pick up arms. Now, Somalia is a very um, interesting case. The, it, the roots uh, when Somalia descended are not understood. I mentioned briefly that we are glad that Mr. Obama is not going to any of the so-called American-friendly tyrants. He is not visiting any of them, which makes us happy. But it's related to Somalia. In 1992, the president of Somalia was Siad Bari. There was a civil war. He left, and he went to Nigeria. And he had been supported by the U.S. as a friendly tyrant. And that allowed um, Somalia to descend into the problem that they've had for 20 years. Now they are slowly climbing back. And the point is, what they need more than anything else is an inclusive government where um, violence is not resorted to. You resolve your differences through democratic and other means. Somebody else had it. Somalia. Well, the problem with uh, Somalia is, of course, a problem of governance. Uh, you know, lack of uh, government institutions and democracy is is there, but it's also a lack of governance. Uh, and governance uh, is at the heart of what is driving the illicit capital, which again impacts adversely economic growth, development, and the meeting of uh, millennium development goals. So. This, uh, this feeds into general instability. What we have seen in our study is that the countries that it is just an anecdotal kind of, is not, I'm not trying to claim that there is a one-to-one -one relationship, but uh, it was surprising that uh, countries such as uh, Nigeria, Libya, and Algeria were, uh, came out at the top of our studies which showed massive outflows on a net basis. That is, when you take the, the inflows of uh, aid, and you uh, net out the unrecorded outflows. Uh, those three countries, uh, Algeria, Libya, and uh, Nigeria were at the top. And that is, uh, that's very worrying, actually. I mean, uh, it's because, I mean, what I want to say is that the illicit flows also create uh, instability of all sorts. Question? If you could identify yourself right in the, in the middle, row. yeah. Uh, I think Patricia. And, uh, MCC, MCC, right? Hi, um, my name is Patricia Kisari with Mennonite Central Committee USA, and I just wanted to comment on the question around Somalia, uh, especially the issue that you don't hear many people speak about, uh, which is around the law that is called Material Resource Law, uh, which is the law where uh, organizations that work in Somalia um, can be found liable if by any chance or whenever they do their work, uh, they are found to be uh, working with anybody who has been tagged as working with the terrorist groups. Now the challenge for organizations, especially peace building organizations, is that they are there to work with the communities. In the case of Somalia, 
almost anybody you find there has at some point has contact has, has had contact with Al Shabaab, for example. But then when you're doing peace building work at community level, most likely you want to reach these folks so that you, you can help them build their lives and, and find alternatives. But organizations are afraid of doing that because if they do that, they could be found liable by the US government. So the, the, the material resource law is a very uh, big issue for Somalia and the administration will just look at, we need to look at it again and, and hopefully uh, make some changes. And uh, Patricia is part of the uh, drafting committee as well for the, uh, for the briefing book. Uh, she's with Mennonite uh, Central Committee. Uh, we have other questions? To, uh, if you could identify yourself as well. Uh, my name is Abdullah Said, and uh, I'm Egyptian. And I'll, I'll best describe myself as an Egyptian revolutionary and activist. Um, I just want to talk about the Nile really quick, and you will get my, my point when I reach at the end. But like the Nile like runs from like 86% uh, or 84% runs from Ethiopia in two branches, and the other branch runs from Victoria Lake, and both of them meet in Khartoum and run north. And then they run north to Egypt until they meet the Mediterranean, you know? Yeah. So in 1950-something, Gamal Abdel Nasser, the Egyptian president, built a high dam because the too much water would flood, and sometimes we wouldn't have water. So to control that and also to get an extra benefit from it, which is electricity, he did that, and that's a benefit from Egypt, and we are not hurting anyone. But now, uh, Ethiopia, for a long time, they have been planning this dam, and the U.S., like, Ethiopia just now used, uh, like, taking advantage of Egypt's problem, interior problems, and, like, started, like, announcing they build dams. And, like, the U.S. support, like, the U.S. government, all the co concern is support for, uh, for, like, like, the U.S. ambassador actually came up with, a speech the other day, she was supporting Morsi to continue, and and like he continues the other stuff, and that's like not her internal business in in Egypt. But like, what about like the whole continent? What about like the River Nile? When they build a dam in Ethiopia, of course it will affect the water level, not only in Egypt but also in Sudan. They are controlling a natural phenomenon. Water is a huge source of like planting and agriculture for many like for <coughs> Sudan and Egypt. So is only the U.S. government uh, all concerned is politics, or just also like people who will may suffer, may suffer and have no food and have no money in their economy is just gone and they can't eat as well. No. Oh, the question you had to comment or the question. Was it's just uh, like I'm I'm concerning why like the U.S. is not paying attention to like other things in in Africa like will affect other countries like that, you know? Like the now, you're talking about the now. I think the, uh, you said that they're not paying enough attention to the now. Uh, to the Nile and like yeah, to treaties, international treaties like. Because the uh, Secretary of State actually did, they did have a discussion about that in the last meeting with the oh, President. I'm sorry, yes, I didn't yes. understand, but like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just really like raising awareness about other stuff yeah, that yeah. the US, like the government is not addressing yeah. important stuff. Yeah, they, and they, it's an issue which is um, very. They've acted yeah, now. Sorry, it <laughs> might not be admitted. I, I hear Somali but, and other stuff. But okay, yeah, yeah, but I think we can. Um, I think there's like, other comments on the panel about yeah. the uh, Nile River Basin, which has been. There's been an ongoing discussion within the continent, actually, the, with all the uh, the countries in the Nile River Basin, about to discuss about what to do with the Nile, and um, I don't know if anybody else had a. Well, first of all, thank you for um, the leadership. Egyptian activists have been uh, incredible at the forefront of, of people's movements on the continent. And we thank you for, um, for the role that you and others like you, young people, have, have played in bringing about change. Um, and we encourage you to keep going. <laughs> but um, in, in, in regards to your question, you know, the, the bigger issue, uh, as, as many of us uh, know, and, and um, both ADNA members and our allies, you know, um, climate change change is, is the core of the issue. And um, climate change is really having the most detrimental impacts on Africa, um, both in terms of the um, rising sea levels for capital cities, including Dakar, where the president will be, and really all the capital cities in West Africa, um, and um, that are already you know, experiencing the impacts of climate change, but, but also the spread of the desert desertification and its impact on places like the Sahel. Um, and, and so I, I think um, clearly what we're calling for is for the the Obama administration to look at the impact of its policies on climate change, to 
support um, environmental justice activists on the continent, um, to encourage um, the voices of those who are trying to look not only at the short-term needs, but the future generational needs of this planet, and to support um, their voices, their vision, uh, not only for Africa, but for the stability of the planet. Um, I think um, with regard to the um, construction of the dam, clearly so many environmental issues linked with that, as well as issues of, of uh, displacement of communities. Um, the, the, the recommendation that's often raised is for the African Union and its um, negotiations mechanisms to really step up <laughs> and to play an active role in resolving this conflict now, not only for the benefit of, of Egypt and Su Sudan and all the countries of the Nile, but really for the, for the long-term interests of the continent. Any other comments on this? I just would like to add to the issue of climate change as well. And again, um, thank you for making your comment. Um, indeed, this is one of our concerns, and we are seeing some serious impacts on populations that are not able to adapt. They did nothing to create the deficit, um, but somehow they are finding themselves having to bear the brunt of the consequences where communities are not able to, they are depending on rain fed agriculture. I think about 50%, if not more, of um, um, farmers in Africa depend on, um, at least in some countries, depend on rain and on readily accessible water sources, and they are not able to have access to them. Um, there are some mechanisms that are in place, such as CADEP, as um, I don't know if anybody mentioned CADEP already, that despite some criticisms for CADEP, I think it is, it is a mechanism that is working and that is probably one of the most viable mechanisms for consultations with populations so that they indeed, it, I sound like a broken record, but that so they indeed can dictate the terms of their future. And just a couple of general comments. Um, there are scientists who forecast that uh, over the next 50 years, the number of conflicts uh, on planet Earth will increase uh, as a result of uh, water uh, shortages. It will, uh, the conflicts will be uh, between countries as well as regions within a country. Uh, for example, now uh, ongoing tensions are there between India and Pakistan and between India and China on the use of dams. Uh, part of the problem is whenever you construct a dam, you're going to displace uh, thousands and thousands of people. That's one problem. And that's never easy to build a dam. And the second problem is when you build a dam, you're going to hurt some people and you're going to help some people. Uh, it's never the situation where the dam helps all people. Uh, so uh, that, that, is, that becomes very controversial. It is not only a situation in the Nile, but the situation uh, we can see uh, in many parts of the world. Uh, but climate change, of course, is the heart of it. We have abused this planet, and now it is time to pay the bill. Uh, any more questions? Uh, I think we still have time in the room. <laughs> but I, I wanted uh, Christina to expand a little bit about the New Alliance uh, program, if we could explain a little bit more about the, that, um, the New Alliance uh, project, uh, program which the Obama administration has initiated. Um, so last year, in May 2012, um, the U.S. Um, and G8 countries, with G8 countries, took the leadership um, to launch a new initiative called the New Alliance for Food Security. And it is an initiative that, um, that, that purports to um, increase food security in Africa by getting, um, by allowing large corporations, private, and private actors, to invest heavily in um, African agriculture. The, the problem is that the new alliance is creating a series of problems that um, were um, anticipated, and, and I think that many actually have warned against the new alliance from its onset, including Action Aid. Um, some say that it is neither new nor an alliance. Um, it is not new because um, it is actually, um, it is, it is, it is supporting the policies that were um, that were born out of the Grow Africa um, initiative, um, where um, so so that's one. So the, the concept is not new. Um, it is not an alliance because it is not allowing um, all stakeholders, particularly those that are most disenfranchised, from participating in the process. So there have been some some. 
criticisms that have actually been born since the formation of the new alliance, including the fact that um, smallholder farming communities are saying that they are ex they excluded from the process, that decisions are being made without their input. In some communities, projects are being started, such as in Mozambique, we've heard, and the communities learned about it from the, the day that it actually was taking, taking hold, as opposed to having been brought into process when the decision was being made. Um, other concerns are that the new alliance is not allowing for um, is there, there are some it's forcing African governments to implement policies that would decrease um, the and actually eliminate the access to uh, local seeds in some instances um, and it would um, um, force African countries to harmonize um, their their tariffs and, and allow for um, for products from um, to open up their markets when smallholder farmers are not able to um, to to compete. So there there is a variety of concerns about the new alliance um, that have been brought um, by ActionAid partners, um, and we we are actively and actually what we at ActionAid um, support is to let, let go of the new alliance and and you utilize the existing mechanisms to to cut up and rethink this process um, because what we want is not. Um, we believe that food security is extremely important to the development and, um, of, of Africa. And we believe that smallholder farmers are the most efficient at addressing the food security concerns of their populations. Um, and for this reason, we do not believe that um, promoting investment agriculture by large multi, um, corpor multinational corporations is the answer to Africa's food security problems. As I mentioned, there are other members of the uh, uh, ADNA coalition in the audience, and we have uh, Friends of the Congo represented. Um, Maurice, if you could give us um, uh, Friends of the Congo's re recommendations for brief. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Misa. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Friends of Congo's um, recommendations as it relates to um, Great, Policy, Great Lakes um, region of Africa um, deals with um, recent um, peace framework that was established by the United Nations. As um, many people know or uh, may not know, uh, Congo and the Great Lakes region has experienced the deadliest conflict in the world since World War II. And um, U.S. Um, policy has played a role in the perpetuation of the, the conflict um, in the region. Um, Ni referenced it in a, in a general sense, where he talked about the impact of um, U.S. policy in relation to its support of um, friendly tyrants. And um, two um, leaders in the region, um, Paul Kagame of Rwanda and Yari Museveni of uh, Uganda, have um, been... Uh, uh, key sources of the destabilization of the Congo, and they've benefited um, tremendously from, from U.S. support, uh, whether it's uh, military training, equipment, finance, uh, and even when those nations commit um, crimes or support um, crimes against humanity or war crimes in the Congo, locally, um, the U.S. Uh, runs interference for them at the international level, um, primarily at the United Nations. So uh, in regard to policy, um, we have um, proposed um, two key um, aims um, as relates to changes in U.S. foreign policy. One is uh, to cease the support of um, uh, those nations that uh, destabilize um, the Congo, um, primarily Rwanda and Uganda, as um, has been um, articulated in U.S. law uh, that um, was um, passed in 2006, sponsored by um, then Senator Obama, um, Section 105 of the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo Relief, Security, and Democracy Promotion Act uh, states that uh, uh, Secretary of State um, is authorized to withhold aid from any nation that destabilizes the Congo. And Rwanda and Uganda um, have been documented by a series of UN reports uh, that uh, say that they have destabilized the Congo. So that's one um, policy recommendation um, that the U.S. Um, cease its support. Um, of uh, those nations that have destabilized the Congo. Secondly, um, the U.S. Uh, stands on the principles of democracy and the support of democracy uh, at home and abroad. And um, part of the instability in the region in the heart of Africa has been 
um, the U.S. support of authoritarian um, regimes. Um, I've mentioned Rwanda and Uganda, and also uh, the DRC. In 20 election, 2011, the Congo had elections uh, that were, for all intents and purposes, uh, appropriated um, by the current Kabila regime. And the United States um, uh, supported um, and legitimized um, those elections. And uh, as a result of that, uh, the appropriation of those elections, um, the Congolese people are under the leadership of uh, a regime that lacks legitimacy and a weak regime. And uh, that uh, contributes to the instability um, in the country and in the region. Uh, therefore, uh, a second recommendation um, that um, we've put forward is uh, for the U.S. Um, going forward um, to support democracy in the region. And um, that uh, principle is also uh, articulated in the law that President Obama um, sponsored and passed in 2006. I think Section 102 of that law calls for U.S. support of um, democratic institutions. We believe those two um, core elements, if um, supported by the United States and if the U.S. changes its policy in those regards, it will help to um, uh, per, uh, help to uh, bring about stability in the region and um, be a foundation for a long-lasting um, change. Unless those two policy changes are um, uh, pursued or are supported um, by the United States, and then it will make it a, a lot more difficult um, for uh, stability to, to arrive in, in the Congo itself and its um, surrounding nations, um, uh, particularly uh, those nations that uh, the U.S. Um, have uh, what Ni characterizes as friendly tyrants. So uh, thank you, Moise, for the opportunity to say that. That's uh, Maurice Carney, is the executive director of uh, Friends of the Congo. And uh, in your packets are also a list of uh, civic society organizations as well as their quotes and also um, uh, yeah, yeah, for people you can get in touch with afterwards, after the press conference. Any other comments? I think we have um, Terence Chota, I actually have a question. Your um, affiliation, please. Your affiliation. Missionary Oblate of Mary Immaculate. Um, considering the different problems that you have mentioned that are roaming around Africa, is it possible that African countries would meet the Millennium Development Goals? Yeah. We'll start with that, David. Well, um, I had worked on this uh, issue um, at the IMF and now in GFI. Uh, it does not look uh, even remotely possible that African countries will be meeting the uh, MDG uh, targets by, I believe it is 2015, 15 years. Uh, most countries, in fact, if not all countries, uh, they're not meeting uh, most of the MDG goals. Maybe one or two uh, targets they're missing, uh, they will be meeting. And, and one of the main reasons is that, of course, I mean, uh, is scarce capital, and, which is exiting those countries. It's not helping matters. Uh, and, and the reason, of course, is, is, uh, is uh, varied. Uh, it all ranges from, as I mentioned, macroeconomic instability, uh, growth that is not inclusive, uh, has ended up making the rich richer and the poor poorer. The gap has increased. Although poverty has declined, but the absolute number of people living in poverty has declined, but the gap between the rich and the poor has actually increased, uh, which uh, again feeds into uh, illicit flows because it's only the super rich that accumulate illicit capital, not the average person on the, on the street. Uh, and uh, the unaccounted uh, amassing of wealth, uh, uh, again, uh, feeds into uh, a larger underground economy, which then again feeds into, it's like a vicious circle uh, that we find in our quantitative research, uh, that the interaction between a large underground economy and uh, is a driver of uh, illicit capital. So uh, I'll be happy to take any further questions. Thank you. Any other comments um, related to that? I think we have a question in front, if you can identify yourself. Yeah, right here. Hi, my name is Sydney. I'm from Interpress Service. I was just wondering if anyone could speak to or respond to the criticisms that Obama's trip, which is reportedly costing between $40 million and $60 million, is costing maybe too much, and just the, the benefits of the trip versus the amount that it's costing. You know, um, I'm, I'm so... 
I am so glad you asked that. My, <laughs> my desire actually showed up physically because I've actually spent days writing an op-ed about it. Um, it's, it's not done yet. Um, um, because, you know, as I mentioned, Mr. Obama has been to uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa 20 hours. He's been to all the other continents much more. Um, so it seems to me it gives the impression that the people who leaked the Secret Service planning document, those who publicized it, the people in Congress who made speeches about it saying that the money is better used for White House visits, it raises questions why they didn't raise those questions when Mr. Obama was going to other countries. Um, you know, it, for me, it's very, very, very troubling. Now, I, I was going to say, so I'm actually glad that so many members of the media are here. So it shows that it's not the entire media, but certain segments of the media were raising the question. They raised it in 2009 when he was going to Accra. They said, why do you bother to go to Accra? When he's going to other African countries, why are you bothering to go there? He was just in Germany. That was not raised. So that, I think, is very, very troubling. And people should understand the impression that it gives on the continent, that certain segments of the United States don't even want him to come to Africa, much less have a progressive Africa uh, uh, policy. Now, I dare say that those questions were not raised when other presidents have visited continents where their forebears were. So I, for one, think that that phenomenon is very, very troubling, and I'm still wrestling with my op-ed. Um, I, I, Ni said quite, a, uh, I think, a lot in his response. I think the the other thing is that it 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 continues a dis, a sad trend of um, the perception of the continent by the media, uh, which is basically it doesn't matter, it's irrelevant, um, and as I think has been articulated here, it is relevant. Um, unfortunately, for a lot of the wrong reasons. Um, but it is a major front uh, for the for the Pentagon and its and on its war on 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 terror. Um, it is a, a major source of oil to the to the country. Um, it is also, unfortunately, because of bad policies and inter and, and and developments, um, perceived as a humanitarian focal point, not for the right reasons. Um, the one of the, the things that the coalition shares here is the fact that, um, as I mentioned, they, we don't have an assistant secretary of state for Africa, and yet this is a continent that is arguably in the spotlight in terms of, of strategic concerns for the for, for, for the United States. So the 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 f media frenzy about the cost of the trip. Um, unfortunately lends itself to, to being described as, as not only being um, backward, but also potentially racist, which is, which is something that people have to be honest about. Um, he's going to be going, hopefully, to have a historic message. That's what we hope. It shouldn't be a lighthearted, easy trip, or it shouldn't, all, it shouldn't be just about investing and business, because there are some serious issues that need to be addressed. That's why we did this press conference. Hopefully, the White House itself has begun to pick up on the fact that they need to explain why the continent is important, what are the opportunities there, and why he's going, and why uh, the, the focus should be on substantial issues as opposed to just the cost. And, and of course, we know that the um, Assistant Secretary uh, for Africa was announced on Friday, but the, but the, but the uh, vacancy has been there for way too long, and it would have been good that he had been uh, she had been appointed earlier and confirmed so that she could have gone in an official capacity with the president. Uh, I'm, I'm tempted just to reinforce that Africa has over a billion people. I think many people in this room already know that, but just to make sure that it's clear why Africa matters, <laughs> over a billion people, largely the demographics of my, my brother from Egypt, young people, right, under 30. Africa is the continent for the 21st century. It's not only because of the significance of Africa's resources, oil, gas, mining, uranium, the list is so long. Um, 
for the, the, the centrality and significance of those resources for the global economy. Um, but it's also, Africa's on the move. Africa's rising. Um, and so I think if the U.S. wants to be in step with not only the 21st century, but the centuries to come, they need to pay attention to Africa. Trips like these are a critical reminder to not only policymakers, but the American public of the significance of a continent that is on the rise. So again, my, my colleague Dev can say it best, you know, the economists have said seven of the top 10 growing economies are where? In Africa, right? So if the U.S. is interested in the future, not only of its um, economic stability and vitality, but the future of technology, much of which is happening on the continent. Let's remember South Africa, where the president is going, helped to get the Mars rover. <laughs> Many people don't realize that, but this past March, South Africa played a role because of its technological base in getting a rover up on Mars. Right? Africa is changing. Africa is rising. The U.S. must and should be a part of that. Uh, last round of questions. Hi, I'm uh, with the Institute for Policy Studies, and I know um, mentioning South Africa, I was just kind of curious as to how Nelson Mandela's deteriorating um, critical condition will be affecting Obama's trip, um, if anyone would like to weigh in on that. Any uh, comments from this side? Uh, I, don't, I don't know whether, um, I mean, we certainly can't speak on behalf of the administration, and we wouldn't want to. Um, I think that um, clearly, um, for, for the continent, Mr. O Mr. Mandela is f a fairly important figure. Um, <laughs> and uh, actually, I would argue globally. It's not just for, for, for Africa. And uh, um, I mean, logistically, simply, very basically, um, were something to happen, um, it would obviously impact the South African change. government's ability to, to host a presidential visit. Although I think President Zuma just said that the that there, the meetings and the visit would still go forward. Um, I think it would probably also arguably detract from the, pres the, the focus on the president's trip. Um, but it might also be an, oppor uh, an, an opportunity to sort of remind people about who Nelson Mandela was and what he did and what he stood for, um, which is a powerful reminder that policies currently in place need to be reexamined. I just want to add uh, to Adote, it, it, is, it will be a very powerful reminder that the importance of the African continent as a leader, uh, that we have had statement, statesmen like Mandela uh, who've come out of there because as uh, Mimira was talking about, the, the image of Africa constantly is always uh, a, con a continent looking out for outside assistance or, or help and in, that, in, that, in that framework. But when you look at a Mandela who uh, has been an independent voice, very courageous throughout his, uh, his political life, uh, has always spoken truth to power, it also gives, it, uh, in, in his embodiment, presents the image which you don't often see, but is there. He's not the only one that has been like that. He's been the most known, but you've had the Nyerere's and Kwame Nkrumah's and others who have not been uh, as exposed. So hopefully this gives an opportunity to to show the world that there are solutions coming out directly from the African continent, even in times of tragedy, as we have, uh, sadly, if we end up losing him in this period. Uh, but I think it changes, it just uh, off, it will change the whole trip in general, because it's not, as we said, it affects the whole continent. Uh, I mean, I can't see the AU not, there's gonna be something, if something happens, I think it's gonna be a very different uh, state trip. I don't think it'll be the same trip as we see it now. Well, last question. I'm Janet Gottschalk from the Medical Mission Sisters and from Adna. Uh, I just have a comment. It seems to me, with all this hoo-ha that's going on about this Ed Snowden guy, uh, I mean, there's nothing else on the news. And uh, it's going to be hard-pressed for even Obama to... Uh, uh, make a dent in that, I'm thinking. And then if we have uh, Mandela die at the same time, I mean, the trip is going to be just kind of peanuts. <laughs> I think, uh, um, as, as Janet said very quickly, she's an Adnast stalwart. And as one of the, I'm one of the old people in Adna, um, I think it should be emphasized that people in Adna 
are very persistent and they take the long view. And so, yes, it's possible that Snowden, the, the global chase for him, if something happens to Mr. Mandela, that also might shift media attention a little bit. But Adna is not nothing if not um, persistent and focus on the issue. So the issue of Africa, the various issues that we have raised, will will keep going. And let me emphasize again, Adna is not really a new organization. There have people been in the coalition for a long time, and there are times when even in the 80s, the fight against South Af um, Reagan administration's support of apartheid was very unpopular in Washington, D.C. And I know for a fact, friends will tell me, why do you care about South Africa? Who is Mandela? Nobody cares about him. There were prominent people in Washington who told me, so we will persist whatever happens in the rest of the news. Well, I just want to thank all of you for uh, attending the conference. And again, uh, for the press, we have the briefing book, which has all the information of all the civic organizations and the, uh, the quotes and the contacts. Uh, that you can make uh, after this trip. And hopefully you don't end on just uh, focusing on the trip, that we use this uh, trip as a platform to engage in the issues concerning the African continent throughout the year and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you.